should have we should rock the accordion. <laughs> yes, yeah. I said it. Well, welcome everyone. Um, that was all the announcements. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah you can okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Welcome, uh, potluck. Should be good. There's coffee, and then the restrooms are around. Uh, go out, turn left, and then we're over to the right. And then, um, Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we could be here and uh, worship you in safety and um, just give us peace with everything that's going on in the world. And uh, just uh, bless the service, bless uh, bless the message, and uh, allow us to receive it into our hearts. And uh, thank you for the food and, and bless everyone who uh, helped in preparing it. And, just thank you for everything you give us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Scott. Well, we're continuing in the Gospel of Luke, and we made it to chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. And this is a very interesting passage of Scripture. We've all read it many times, but we're going to delve into the powerful and transformative passage in the Gospel of Luke. Jairus, one of the rulers of the synagogue whose daughter was dying, and a woman who was not named, who was sick for 12 years. And her particular sickness, this issuing of blood that she had, would render her an outcast from all of the Jews because she was unclean. They couldn't even touch her. They couldn't get near her. For 12 years, she had this sickness. These two narratives intertwine, revealing profound truths about the nature of faith, healing, and the transformative power of Christ's love. Amen? We've been transformed, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a transformation that takes place in our heart. Folks, we don't just intellectually assume that, oh yeah, Christ is real, I believe, so now everything's good. But a transformation takes place. We get filled with the Holy Spirit. Old things are gone. Behold, all things are new when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. So first we meet Jairus, a synagogue leader who approaches Jesus with great urgency, <clears throat> pleading, falling on his knees. Now, he's a leader of a synagogue. At this time, apparently, they are hoping and praying that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And so this leader of the synagogue comes and prostrates himself before Christ and begs him to come heal his daughter. As Jesus is going to his house, a woman who had been sick for 12 years touches Christ's garment secretly, and she's instantly healed. And so that's the story. Let's dive into the text, Luke chapter 8, verse 40. And as Jesus returned, where, where is he returning from? We covered it two weeks ago. Remember, he said, let's cross to the other side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee. Yeah. And they went and they cast the demon out of the guy in the tombs on the other side. And all the demons, that was actually a legion, what did they do? Went to the pigs. And the pigs instantly did what? Dying. Killed themselves. Folks, every suicide that happens in the world is Satan's doing. I want you to know that. I want you to hear this. It's not the unpardonable sin. These people are so influenced by uh, demonic forces. He comes to still kill and destroy. The pigs couldn't fight it. We have this innate uh, self-preservation that we have. All of us have. When we lose that, that's the enemy. The fiery darts of Satan are weird thoughts. And people that get suicidal, they just can't battle those. We take every thought captive. We have the shield of faith. But they lose that battle. And ultimately, Satan's plan is suicide. So he gets back from that. right? They kicked him out of the country. Why? Because they were Gentiles and they loved bacon. And they thought Jesus was going to kill all the pigs because he was a Jew. No, the townspeople are really probably thinking, he just killed all of our pigs. <laughs> we got to get this Jew out of our country. And when he returned, the people welcomed him, for they had been waiting for him. And in Christ's ministry, early on, they hoped 
and potentially believed that he was the Messiah, verse 41. And there came a man named Jairus, and he was an official, literally ruler of the synagogue, and he fell at Jesus' feet and began to implore him to come to his house. For he had, only, uh, he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. But as he went, the crowds were pressing in against him. Another example of the synoptic differences, Mike, we won't call it problems, right? <laughs> Matthew uh, says it like this, Matthew 9, 18. And while he was saying these things to them, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him. That agrees with Luke 100%, but then this doesn't. And he said, my daughter has just died. Come lay hands on her and she will live. Mark agrees with Luke. Um, Mark says in Mark 5, 23, and uh, the synagogue official implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. So again, Luke and Mark say, oh, she's not dead yet, but she's dying. Matthew says, oh, she already died. Can you come raise her from the dead? Okay, that's a difference. That's, does it affect the story at all? The narrative? The historicity of it. No, we have three different witnesses writing from their perspective what happened. Could be that Matthew just didn't recall that she hadn't died until Jesus got there. But let's continue in our text. Luke 8, 43. And a woman who had a hemorrhage, literally that's two Greek words. And it means a flowing of blood. Okay, for about 12 years. And could not be healed by anyone. Mark gives us more detail. I'm shocked that Luke didn't because Luke was a Gentile and was a physician. Are you with me? But Mark gives us about the physicians. Maybe Luke didn't want to admit that the doctors failed her. <laughs> the doctors kind of stick together, don't they? Yes. But Mark says in Mark 5, 26, and had endured much at the hands of many physicians like Luke, and had spent all that she had. She spent every dime that she had on doctors trying to be healed for 12 years. And was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. Interesting. It's interesting that she was going through the most incredible trial you can imagine in those days. With that issuing of blood, she was unclean. Just like a leper, no one could touch her for 12 years. She spent every dime she had to try to get healed. And she had no hope. But she heard of this Jesus. And she came through the crowds. More than likely, she had to disguise herself because everyone would have known, hey, she's unclean. You can't touch her. And so she probably didn't even want to touch physically Jesus, but just touch the hem of his garment. And she had faith that said, if I can only do that, I'll be healed. And came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment or cloak, and immediately the hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. It's kind of like, have you ever been at a big concert or a big event where the crowds, you're literally just touching everybody trying to get through? So it was much like that, I imagine. But Jesus said, someone did touch me, for I was aware, and note this, power had gone out of me. That is a very interesting statement. So Christ, unbeknownst to him, was walking... Someone touched them with enough faith that as they did that, this woman, this courageous woman who had incredible faith, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. And she got the touch. And all of a sudden, Jesus felt power go out of him. That word power in the Greek is where we get the term dynamite. In fact, it's actually dunamis in the Greek. It's G1411. It means strength, power, miraculous power. Every time it talks about the power of God in the New Testament, it's dunamis. 
Okay, the empowering of the Holy Spirit, dunamis, throughout the New Testament. Matthew 13, 54, it says, He came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Miraculous powers is dunamis, dunamis, just repeated. Okay, so that's the power that left Christ. It's the same word to describe the power of God, and we receive that power through the Holy Spirit, Acts 1.8. And you will receive dunamis, miracle-working power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, even the remotest parts of the earth. The apostate church denies that power, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. They hold to a form of godliness, note this, although they've denied its dunamis. Avoid such men as these. Okay, those churches and even full denominations are denominations that say the sign gifts are no longer for the church today. It's interesting, the Bible says they will not cease until we see Christ face to face. Then we won't need the gifts. We'll be in our raptured, glorified, awesome bodies. No more pain, sickness, death. Oh, man, it's going to be amazing. We will fully know even as we're fully known. We won't need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But as for now, we desperately need that. But whole denominations deny the dunamis, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The empowering of the Holy Spirit. Next week is Pentecost. That's 50 days after the resurrection or Easter Sunday morning when the church was born and when the Holy Spirit was given to us. The Jews call it Shavuot, which means weeks in Hebrew. And it's probably one of the most important Jewish holidays that you've never heard of. Many people, what's Shuvaot? <laughs> what, what, what Jewish holidays have you heard of? Yom Kippur. Monica. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Rosh, Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Passover. Passover. Uh, uh, Feast Pur of Weeks. Shavuot. Pur Purim. Yeah, Peru. Yeah, yeah. The celebration of Peru. Okay. Not really. Anyway, let's get back to our text. <laughs> Luke 8, 47. And when the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before Jesus and declared in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him. So she told him the whole story and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her daughter... Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You know, Jesus continues to say that to us today. Go in peace. This unnamed woman had exhausted every resource seeking medical help. And we know even back then, doctors are expensive. Man, health care is super expensive, isn't it? Oh, my goodness gracious. She had endured years of suffering, both physically and socially. She was an outcast and unclean. No one, not even her husband, could touch her if she was married. She would have been excluded from everything for all of those 12 years. She couldn't go to the temple. She couldn't go into the synagogue. Uh, yeah, she was an outcast and unclean. In her desperation, she mustered the courage. And she said in her heart, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be well. That's incredible faith. Who had the greatest faith so far as we've been going through the gospel of Luke? It was that centurion, right? He said, I too am a man of authority and you don't have to come to my house. Just say the word right now and my, my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, I have not seen such great faith in all of this room. I love it that it was a Gentile <laughs> that did that. She had this great faith. She believed the slightest connection with him would bring healing. With faith as her guiding light, she reaches out and touches the hem of his garment and immediately was healed completely. When the woman touched Jesus' garment, he felt power go out. That dunamis power. In that instant, Jesus turned and affirmed her faith. 
and acknowledged her healing. And he said, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This touch not only brought physical healing for her, but restored her place of dignity, of peace. She could now go worship in the synagogue for the first time in 12 years. She could go and eat with people and hug people for the first time in 12 years. It reminds us that when we reach out to Jesus in faith, his touch can tr transform and heal our lives. You know, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? All your needs will be met. That seeking, that seeking is much like this woman here who sought Christ. And folks, it's not seeking just at church, at worship, when we raise our hands and we're seeking to just touch the Lord or have the Holy Spirit touch us. But it's in our private prayer times. It's in our times we spend with God, we spend in the Word of God, and we pray through Scripture, and we connect with God, and we seek Him with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and with all our strength. That's when healing comes. That's when God's transformative work, and I started this message saying, hey, salvation is a transformation. It's not, okay, this is who I am pre-Christ, and now I'm the same person, but I just have an intellectual assent that, yeah, Jesus lived and, uh, you know, I received him in my heart. No, the Holy Spirit begins to transform us into the image of Christ. We begin to be little Christ. We're his hands and feet extended. We begin to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and it naturally grows within us. In this miraculous moment, we witness the power of faith. In action, the woman's unwavering belief and faith that even a touch of Christ's garments would bring healing propelled her forward. Her faith was not passive. Faith was active and expressed through her reaching out to Christ. And folk, faith is an action word. So is love. Likewise, our faith must be more than just mere belief. A lot of people believe, but they don't have real faith. It must move us to action and draw us closer to Jesus. But this passage does not end there. Back to Jairus. Luke 8, 49. And while he was speaking, someone came. Now, I want you to put yourself in Jairus' shoes, right? Okay, he's a leader, ruler in the synagogue. He prostrated himself before Christ. Please, my daughter is about to die with urgency. Please come heal her. And then this woman, as he's approaching the house, whoa, wait a minute, hey, someone touched me. Jairus was probably like, okay, we don't care about that. Come, my daughter's about to die. Please, come in my house. She's about to die. It's too late. Luke 8, 49, while he was still speaking, Jesus, someone came from the house of the synagogue's official saying, your daughter has died. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But when Jesus heard this, he answered him, do not be afraid any longer. Only believe and she will be made well. All the commands in scripture, the one that is repeated more than any other command is fear not. Don't be afraid. You know when you have faith in God, you don't have to fear troubling times. We don't have to fear a horrible diagnosis that the doctors might give us. We don't have to fear anything because God is on our side. We're his children, and as much as we love our spouses and our children and our parents and our family and our church family, God loves us a million times more, a billion, quadzillion, a Googleplex. Have you ever heard of that number? <laughs> That's yeah, one of the biggest numbers we can count to, yeah, or conceive of. <laughs> right. Don't be afraid. Only believe. I believe that's Christ's message to us today. And uh, as we go through it, Jesus' statement, do not be afraid any longer. Only believe is a powerful and profound declaration that resonates with people from every culture across all time. 
These words are spoken by Jesus in our text, carry a message of hope, faith, and liberation from fear. They don't have to be driven by fear. Many people live their lives and make decisions based on fear rather than faith. Are you with me? Okay, well, I'm afraid this might happen, so I need to do this. It's better to be driven by faith rather than fear. In all we do, fear is innate human emotion that can be both protective. You know, Cheryl and I were walking down in the canyon one time, and I was looking for rattlesnakes, but she grabbed my arm and stopped me, and I'm like, what, what? And she just pointed at mountain lion, like from here, me and a mic back there, right in the trail, looking us in the eye. <laughs> I'm like, do I grab my phone or my knife? You know? <laughs> uh, but that was a fear response, for sure. It's a protective mechanism, or it can be a hindrance to everything God wants to do in your life. It can paralyze us, preventing us from taking risks, pursuing our dreams, embracing new opportunities. Jesus understood the debilitating effects of fear and consistently encouraged his followers to overcome it. And in our text, he urged them to let go of fear and replace it with unwavering faith. Whatever you're afraid of today, God is bigger than that. The power in you is greater than the trial before you. He is with you and will hold you and empower you and give you that dunamis power from the Holy Spirit to handle any challenge life might throw your way. The second part of Jesus' statement, only believe, so do away with fear, replace it with faith, highlights the transformative power of faith. Luke 8, 51, and when he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except Peter, John, James, and the girl's father and mother. Now they were all weeping and lamenting for her. And he said, stop weeping, for she has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him, knowing that she had died. Puzzling. I, 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 I pondered this for quite a while. You know, here this synagogue's official 12-year-old uh, daughter, his only daughter, just died. And they were weeping and lamenting and mourning. And then Jesus said, hey, stop weeping. She hasn't died. She's just sleeping. And then all of a sudden that weeping turned to mockery and laughter of Christ. See, back then it could be that they had already paid some mourners to come mourn. You know, oftentimes there were professional mourners. And when someone died, they would pay them to wail and lament. So it sounds to me like they possibly had some lined up, ready to go. Or maybe they were even at his house thinking, oh, wow, she's dying. Let's get ready, and he'll pay us some money to mourn with him. <laughs> Who knows? But to turn mourning into mockery, laughing, and the, the word in the Greek there, they begun laughing at him, is to laugh and mock him at someone. All right. Verse 54, he, however, took her by the hand, called, saying, child, arise. And note this, her spirit returned. You see, the second we die, our spirit leaves our body. For us who are born again, who put our faith in Christ, Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen? So instantly, we are in the presence of God. We don't die, we just move. This is just a tent. This is my temporary home. My eternal home is going to be a body that is, you know, no more pain, a brand new body and all of that. So our spirit just moves from this old body to the other. But when Jesus raised her from the dead, child arise, he called her spirit from where? Back then he hadn't died yet, so she was in Abraham's bosom. She opened where all the good people went back in those days. Abraham's bosom. Not, not the bad part of uh, Sheol, but the good part. And he just called her spirit back. Hey, move back in. Not time to go yet. Her spirit returned, and she got up immediately. And he gave orders for something to be given her to eat. 
And her parents were amazed, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. Okay. He did that often, didn't he? This passage invites us to reflect on our own lives and challenges that we face. Like Jairus, we may encounter moments of desperation where all seems lost and our hearts are heavy with sorrow. In those times, it's crucial to remember Christ's words, do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. Replace fear with faith. Our faith in Jesus should not waver in the face of adversity. We must trust that he has the power to bring healing, restoration, and life to our seemingly hopeless situations. He knows what you're going through. The story reminds us that Jesus is not limited by circumstances or even death itself. He overcomes all challenges and all things in our lives that can cause pain and sorrow. Whether it's a prominent synagogue leader or an outcast woman, Christ responded to their cross and brought healing. Worship team, come on. Fear is an ever-present reality in our lives. We all have fears. Fear of losing our job. Fear of losing our kids. Fear of losing our marriage. We all have many fears that we face. But they need not define us. Amen? Because as children of God, we have faith. And it's a faith that is amazing and remarkable. As followers of Christ, we are called to a life of faith. A life that trusts God's goodness and embraces his promises and overcomes our fear through his power, his dunamis. Let's remember that faith is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. I want to end with these two verses as we're waiting for Scott to come up. <laughs> 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of dunamis, power, and love, and a sound mind, or literally disciplined mind in the Greek, and know this, God loves you, and there is nothing that you have to fear. I love this in 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And this morning, God loves you. There's nothing to fear, saying to God. Why don't we stand? Father God, we thank you that you love us so much. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be in our midst, that you would fill us, God. And for any of us here that are watching online that are dealing with fear, God, I pray that you would give them hope, that you would give them strength, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit and that dunamis power so that they could replace any fears they have with incredible faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Brent, for that powerful message. Yes. Uh, please, please join our closing uh, song, Living Water. So come down to the living water, rise up new. Mm -hmm.